Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? I can, yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, you have granted Ms. Bolsover a permission to attend remotely today, so she appears in front of me on a screen. So I see, yes. Thank you. Uh, can I call Ms. Bolsover? Of course, yeah. Good morning, Ms. Bolsover. My name's Jane, and I'll take you through the affirmation. If you'd like to repeat after me, please. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. <coughs> shall be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you give your full name, please? Uh, Alison Bolsover. Ms. Bolsover, you should have in front of you a witness statement dated the 5th of May of this year. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Could I ask you to turn to page 42, it's the final yeah. substantive page? Uh, is that your signature on the page there? It is, yes. yes. And is that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? It is, yes. Thank you. For the purpose of the transcript, that statement is WITN 06120100. Um, that statement will be published on the inquiry's website shortly. I'm going to begin just with a little bit of background. You worked for the post office for 36 years between 1985 and 2021. Is that correct? Correct, yes. You progressed from an administrative grade the whole way up to senior manager? Yes, that's right. And for today's purpose in particular, um, between 2007 and 2018, you were the senior debt recovery manager. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It, it, it did have different titles, but in my statement, I've, I've continued to, to say that senior debt recovery manager. Can you give us an idea of a few of those titles or some of those titles? Um, I think there was one ar around like a branch accountant and um, various names, uh, revenue protection manager, but mainly it's been in latter years senior debt recovery manager up until me not having debt recovery in 2018. Thank you very much. And the department that you were based in was originally called the Product and Branch Accounting Department, is that right? That's correct, yes. And then it became the Financial Services Centre. Yes. Are you able to assist us in terms of the timing of that change? Oh, uh, I can't remember the exact dates. It, it actually moved different names because then it also latterly became... Um, the branch reconciliation team within network so it's had three three different steps although the same the same teams within it or similar teams within it uh product to branch accounting first then transaction correction transaction processing and then um branch reconciliation team Thank you. And were there any substantive differences between those departments or significant differences between those departments? And other than different teams that I was managing. So um, whenever there was a, a reorganisation or, or, or teams were moving about, I might take different leads for different teams. And in 2018, you became senior manager in the network operations support team. Um, heading the branch reconciliation team, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And, and that was in uh, until 2021 when you retired? Yes. yes. Was there a difference between your role in 2018 onwards uh, and your role prior to that? Um, I didn't have the current and ages, former agent step team working to me after, I think, 2018. So they split into another part within the network support team. But I, I took on all the issuing of transaction corrections within my area and inquiries. Thank you. I'm going to take you to an organogram, which might give us an idea of um, your position in the hierarchy for, for quite a lot of that time. Can we look at FUJ 00116860, please? And it's page 57.
so we have you in the top of the hierarchy there. This is, I think, a 2009 organogram. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have you there at the top, branch conformance and liaison manager, um, yes. managing, for example, Andrew Wynn, the relationship manager. Yeah. Uh, and we have the fraud and conformance team underneath you, uh, another layer below. Yeah. That, that was until 2012, and then that moved into security. Uh, and can you assist us with that? What, is the diff what do you see as the difference between fraud and conformance? Um, the team were looking for, for various patterns, and I think the, the biggest role that they did play was looking for excessive catch in the network. So um, contacting branches to try and reduce... reduce um, potentially risk um, of, you know, if a, a, an office had a robbery or a burglary, so to reduce the cash holdings that are in there, but also looking for patterns of um, any, anything that, that caused concern. So were the patterns that, you know, the, there was excessive transaction corrections or things like that? And it could be that, yes, there could have been an element of fraud, but it was also around the conformance aspect. So on the one hand, you have fraud, which is an offence of dishonesty, uh, and on the other, you have conformance, which might be um, somebody simply not following the right processes and procedures. Is that a, a fair distinction between the two? Yeah. Uh, and did you see it as appropriate that those two teams were part of the same team? Uh, not potentially, no, no. I think the, the fraud element was around looking at data to see if there were patterns. Um, the team wouldn't necessarily uh, progress fraud themselves. They'd pass it to the, a security team. Uh, so it's around finding the data. It, were there any patterns? And raising a flag to say, is there an issue here? Cap security, can you investigate it? You say in 2012 that team moved to the security team. Are you able to assist us with why it moved to the security team? I think it was seen that you know they, they could do the analysis themselves and it fits, rather than being within project, project and branch accounting, it sat better within the security area. Um, we're going to come to it in due course, but in 2012 it was quite an important period in the post office. Um, in respect of emerging concerns about the Horizon system. Um, are you aware of that in any way playing a role in that team moving to the security department? I don't believe it, it formed a role in, it, it formed that role. It, it was just around looking at what teams we were managing at the time and it moved out. Likewise, cash control moved out of my area. So there was different splits of, of teams so I was predominantly around um, um, accounts receivable as such and collecting, collecting debts. Um, so the, the, some teams were moved out and one being fraud, fraud and conformance into security. Cash control went to sit within another senior manager within um, product and branch accounting. Thank you very much. That can come down. Thank you. I'm going to take you through a, a few basic terms and principles that you'll be well familiar with, quite a few people in this room will be familiar with, but it will assist us in looking at the, the various policies. I'm going to begin by looking at the, the process for disputing debts, uh, and then I'll move on to the recovery of debts before moving on to other topics. Uh, so starting with disputing debts, in your statement, you refer to the SAP or the Pol SAP or the SAP um, system. Can you can you assist us with in, in basic terms what that was? So um, it's a, um, a a standard. Well, it, it was supposed to be a standard SAP package that the finance ledgers were sat on as such. So all um, transactions at summary level daily fed through to a SAP, whole SAP GL, GL account. Um, and information from clients came in and were matched. So then 
if there was a mismatch, it was investigated, and that could lead to a transaction correction being issued. Thank you. So, if, sorry, I'll, I'll take you through transaction corrections yeah. in a moment. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of that system, though, was that the main system then that you used to carry out, your department used in order to carry out their function? Yes, that and uh, Credence. Um, so looking at individual transactions in Credence, whereas Pulsat was a summary of that day's transaction, Credence was seen as each individual transaction. Thank you very much. And, and are we talking about post-2005 in respect of these systems? No. No, they predated the, the, the changes. Uh, they, they were uh, Pulsat was introduced um, uh, in 2005, late 2005, after the uh, branches were started using Horizon. Then Chesterfield... Prior to 2005, Chesterfield was working on a paper basis. After 2005, it was more electronic data. Thank you. And error notices. You say that pre-2005, uh, nothing in relation to the cash account was automated in branches, and the sub-postmaster completed a paper cash account and sent it to Chesterfield. Um, That's correct. I'd like to clarify what you mean there by paper cash account. Presumably, that did include a Horizon printout of some sort. It, the sub-postmasters weren't still keeping a separate written record, for example, of all their transactions. Until the whole network was transformed as such, we were still keying documents. So I do believe there were um, some branches that sent Horizon data as such, or an Horizon sheet, but there were still paper cash accounts as well, which was literally a piece of paper that was completed by hand. So prior to 2005, there were, uh, for those who had the Horizon system in place, um, Chesterfield was actually referring to Horizon printouts, though, in order to carry out their analysis. I, I, think, there were, I think there were being keyed. I'm, I'm unsure. I, I can't quite remember whether there was any level of interface prior to 2005. But mainly it was around keying a cash account, man manually keying a cash account, and the supporting documents. And can you uh, assess us with well. what you mean by keying? Physically keying the data into a system. Thank you. And can you tell us what an error notice was, please? Um, it's... It's either um, where there's a difference in the values, either a debit or a credit. So we're either um, requesting money for a debit PC or giving a credit to the branch where they've understated something and um, they're claiming a credit. And prior to 2005, that would be dealt with by Chesterfield, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Uh, and that wasn't something that you were involved in? Uh, I was involved in, in managing up the teams as such, um, but there was a whole raft of people there as well. So there was quite a few senior managers got in, get, had different areas at that time. Moving to transaction corrections, those who have been following the inquiry carefully will know what transaction corrections are, but can you briefly tell us what you understood transaction corrections to be? Um, a, a transaction correction is issued via the Pulse app system or, um, and it's an electronic message to Horizon that, that confirms what's happened. So with, it, it's, got, it's either a, a, a debit or a credit to the branch and it's got a narrative on it to say what has happened, what's gone wrong as such. Um, postmaster's not claimed enough uh, within his pouch or you know, a, a cash remittance and things like that. So any, any product that was matched, we, we, any differences were sent to branches. And the issuing of transaction corrections came from within your department, is that correct? Um, I took the issuing of 
transaction corrections around 2016, I think. So initially I was doing it from 2005 to 2007. Then I wasn't issuing, my teams weren't issuing transaction corrections up until, um, I think, 2016. Who, the, uh, 16. who was responsible in between those periods? Uh, other senior managers within Project and Branch Accounting. So there was, I think there was five senior managers reporting in to Rod Ismay. And can you assist us with why a system of transaction corrections is needed? Um, uh, uh, to enable us to, as such, balance the book. If, if in a, a purely, you know, everything going right scenario, if um, a branch has keyed something in wrong to Horizon, the clients would be paid incorrectly. By issuing the transaction correction, we are then amending that um, product to pay the clients correctly and balance the books as such in the, in the branches. So if they've taken £1,000 but only paid 100 they should have a surplus and a transaction correction would request that surplus. And the way that it would work is data would come from two main sources, uh, and that's the horizon system, but also data from the client. So when we speak about clients, you're talking about, for example, Camelot or an ATM or debit cards. Is, is that correct? Yeah, or, or cash management from a, um, for cash re remittances. Thank you. Um, there's also something called a transaction acknowledgement. Very briefly, can you tell us what a transaction acknowledgement is and how that's different from a transaction correction? Um, a transaction acknowledgement sends out the data that the clients have given us as an electronic message into Horizon to ask the branch to confirm or acknowledge that that transaction is what they took that day or those transactions. So such as Camelot for the online game, it would, it, it, when it was originally um, put in place, it was called a ping project. It was around pinging data out to branches rather than branches having to put the figures in themselves. Thank you. M moving back to transaction corrections, can you assist us with what level of expertise and experience um, the staff who were carrying out those transaction corrections were? There was a lot of experienced staff within product and branch accounting and um, some left after, you know, 49 years service to retire. So there was a, a lot of experience there on the product. So the teams dealt specifically with products. Um, so they became expert in that product line and, and how um, to gain additional evidence for such as Camelot or you know, another supply, another client as such. So they could then investigate, use the systems as well. So such as um, check remit remittances, there was a system where we could see all the checks that had been processed and be able to analyze that. And the staff were able to analyze that against the data. Thank you, that's their experience. But in terms of their level within the company, I think you've said that you started at administrative grade and moved to eventually senior manager. Where did that, on that hierarchy, did the people who were dealing with transaction corrections uh, fall? They, they were administration gr grades, postal officers. Thank you. Can we look at poll 00029370, please? Uh, this is a document from 2010 called Review of the Creation and Management of Transaction Corrections in Poll FS to Correct Accounting Errors in Horizon. Uh, and it has you down there as an approver. Is this a document that you remember from your time? I, I vaguely remember it, it being produced, yes. Can we look at page eight, please? And it's 3.1 I'd like to look at, please. Thank you. So it says there, there are investigating and creating transaction corrections. There are several ways to create a transaction correction in POLFS. 
The manual option is used by teams that don't raise many transaction corrections. These teams spend time investigating errors and inquiries that don't result in a transaction correction. Uh, the automated option creates transaction correction individually, but carries data into fields from the original open item. Uh, teams that are driven by requested transaction corrections are able to use a spreadsheet to upload bulk branch details. This saves time and effort. Are, are you able to assist us there with what that all means? It sounds as though there are multiple different ways of creating a transaction correction. Yes, the, the, the word. Um, the open individual open item was for the branch. So a branch with that had a difference on the general ledger account. Um, the team could go in and issue a individual transaction correction um, straight from the system. So it, it went onto a file that was then uploaded into uh, Horizon. The other method, such as cash remittances, they could be um, bulk uploaded as such. So the cash centres would send information on the differences between what was stated as returned for, from a cash, uh, cash remittance to the, from the branch to the cash centre, any differences were uploaded onto a spreadsheet and that would be uploaded into the system. Thank so you. It, it was a bulk upload as such of information going out. And was that quite a manual process in terms of the creating of a spreadsheet uh, and uploading it on in that way? Not, not from a, a, um, a cash point of view. The um, data was was um, collated by the cash centres. So, from a product and branch accounting or transaction processing point of view, it was a file that needed loading rather than individual items that needed to be gone through and a narrative put on. So another center. department created that file? Yes, it did. Thank you. Um, it, can we look at paragraph 19 of your witness statement? It says w, it's WITN 06120100, and it's page 11. Paragraph 19, you've described it this way. You say, the open item accounts were fed by two streams of data, one from, branch, from the branch via Horizon and the other stream from a client, cash center, or supplier that processed items such as cash centers, Camelot, ATM, checks, debit cards, and MoneyGram. The, otem, the open item uh, accounts were matched daily. Any mismatched or unmatched accounts were investigated uh, to give evidence and narrative for a transaction correction to be issued. Um, can you assess us with what kind of investigation was carried out? Um, it, it depends on, on the product line. So as I've just said around checks, if uh, a branch had dispatched checks to processing, um, any differences that the team member could look at the batch control voucher sent by the branch, and each individual check that was processed behind that batch control voucher. So if there had been a, um, a key and error by the, the branch or the transposed figures, it could be seen on the individual checks and copies of those checks could be sent out to branch and the narrative would be formed around what, which checks were incorrect. So anything that we could investigate in, in that vein was, was done. And we'll come to it in due course, but something like uh, an alleged bug error or defect in Horizon wasn't something that, that your team would investigate. Is that correct? Uh, not, not, I think the, the word bugs and defects were, were not necessarily used. So I think that's where some of the confusions happened. So the, the, there were sometimes issues that were raised by the MBSC and my team or the, the team leader or analyst would be involved in those meetings, but not, not in any scale that 
you know, they'd, they'd ring up and say they'd got a bug, it would go into MBSC. Um, but as part of those, of those investigations that you've described, if it was, a, say, a software error, for example, that's not something that you, you would be able to investigate? No. No, it would have to be IT that, that investigated that. And when you say IT, it who, who do you mean? The IT service desk. Thank you. Um, can we go back to the document we were looking at? It's poll 00029370, and it's page 5. It's the bottom of page 5, please. There's a section here on failed transaction corrections. Yeah. And then if we look over the page, it gives some examples of why some transaction corrections would fail. Uh, yeah. For example, the branch is closed, the value of the transaction correction is not with, within the parameters of product, uh, the product is not valid, uh, crown settled centrally, the wrong flag is chosen when creating the transaction correction, and, and then the final one, Horizon allows branch to roll over to next trading period without accepting all transaction corrections. There is an anomaly in Horizon uh, that when a multi-terminal branch has two or more terminals competing, completing a transaction simultaneously, the branch is able to roll over to the next trading period without accepting all the transaction corrections. Uh, this is not a widely known or occurring problem. Are you able to assist us with that final? I am struggling with that one because um, we did do checks that branches were rolling over. Um, and it, the report that we used to get used to show which, which transaction corrections would have failed. And then the investigation would go on to all these points around, you know, is, it, is, is the branch closed? That's why it's not been able to be be sent or, or to be received. Um, but I don't know. I, I can't remember an this anomaly. It says that this is not widely known, a widely known or occurring problem. Um, was there a, a system within your department to um, share and inform those who are dealing with transaction corrections about these kinds of issues? It, at 2010, I wasn't managing transaction corrections. I don't know, if, is the honest answer. Um, but during the period that you were managing? I'd, I'd never known that happen, so... But was there a um, system in place that, that shared this kind of... I mean, this is, bare, this is one paragraph in quite a thick and complex uh, policy document. Was there a system in place within the department to... Um, make those administrative uh, officers who are dealing with transaction corrections aware of these kinds of issues that might occur with failed transaction if, corrections? If a failed transaction had happened, it would be investigated by the issuer and their team leader to ensure um, the transaction corrections did go out. That, that's um, in an individual case, but was there a process yeah. to share that knowledge? Um, I think there was there were there was some sort of documentation around failed transactions, transaction corrections. So it would have been in the library of um, processes within that. So uh, an individual at administrative grade would have to go into the library, the electronic library, and and try and find out that kind of information. Yeah, I, I think we we had a, a systems team um, at this stage, I, I believe, uh, within product and branch accounting that created the ledgers, et cetera. And they, they flagged that, I think at this stage, they flagged back to the team leader that a transaction correction had failed. It was then investigated and it was the responsibility of the team leader to ensure it was reissued or steps were then taken to, um, if it was a closed branch, the transaction correction would be transferred over to the customer account. So to clear the open item. So there were steps and control steps in place to ensure we didn't just have 
transaction corrections hanging on the system? Again, that's for individual cases, uh, but it yeah. seems to be on, on the head of the, the team leader, effectively, to cascade any information around the team about those kinds of issues, plus a document in a library. Is that yeah. a yeah. fair summary? So there, were, there, there were procedures in place around that, yes. Were there procedures in place? I mean, what were the procedures in place? The, the team leader gained the information from the system system manager and actioned it. So if the, if the transaction correction didn't go out, it stayed as an open item on that GL, GL account. But I think the process you're describing is simply one of it's on the team manager. Yes, and it, it was. Yeah. Um, the list here is quite long of failed transaction corrections. We, we've heard about spreadsheets being created for um, bulk transaction uh, corrections, the yeah. system having input from various different sources. It sounds like quite a complicated system. Is that fair? Was that your experience? After, after working on it 36 years, no, it, it, it didn't seem complex to me, but it would, I believe, with the complexity of the products and everything else. There, there, you know, there was a lot of work within it. And if you were an administrative officer who, who was working in that team, do you think it was quite a complicated process? As an administrator, no. Yes. I, I think the, all the procedures were laid down. Staff did get training if they moved on to new teams. Um, and it was basically a step-by-step -step process for them to administer. And do you think there was potential for, for error in what they were administering because of the complexity, the underlying complexity to the system? I don't think we could ever say that it, it, was, it could be 100% when there's human intervention. Um, th there were issues, and, and um, if a branch had got an issue, they could call the person that had issued the TC to discuss it or to dispute it. In terms of numbers, in your statement, you say that there are approximately 125,000 transaction corrections a year. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take you to one other document that, that you have detailed some further figures. It's poll 00006650. Um, this is, we'll, we'll come back to this a number of times today. This is a conversation that you had with a solicitor at Wombleborn Dickinson in 2018. Uh, I think this is yeah. related to uh, the group litigation. Is this something that you remember? Uh, only from reading it, yeah. I, I, I remember it happening. Um, we have at page 10, it's about halfway down on page 10, um, you, you have given other figures. You say to the interviewer uh, at the bottom there, we're issuing between sort of 7,500 and 12,000 transaction corrections a week. It is, there's quite a lot in there. Uh, some are automatic, so like your lottery TCs, your stock TCs, uh, we do them by upload. Uh, so, it, I mean, if it was 12,000... No, it should say a month. That should be a month, should it? Okay. Um, did those numbers, though, quite high numbers, do they raise any cause for concern? The, the majority of TCs that we, we issued were for cash remittances, where the cash returned by branches um, wasn't correct. So there was a shortage or a surplus within the pouch. And I think it was around, I'm wanting to say, between 50 and 60% of those TCs were related to cash. And did that mean where the cash figure didn't meet the figure that Horizon produced, that, that would be included in that figure? So it, it was, yes, it, it was whatever the, po the postmaster had sent back as a cash remittance to the cash centre, yeah. and then the cash was counted in the cash centre under camera. And where that figure didn't meet the figure on the Horizon printout, that was considered within that percentage that you've just given? Yes, it was. Um, and, and I think it's remembering there were, there were both debits and credits, so 
where there was a, a surplus in the cash that was sent. So the, the branch had understated the cash um, as well as overstated it. Yes. Let's say there were 12,000 transaction corrections a, a month. Do you think yeah. that the team was appropriately resourced to deal with that? Um, there were various cuts within the teams um, along the years, so it, it, we did struggle at times with resource, um, and um, we were always being targeted to, to reduce reduce staffing. But as a whole, I think it became um, it, it was a process that was um, we were on top of in the latter you know the latter years. Can you give us an idea? Uh, you've spoken about trends and times. Um, was it an overall downward trend in, in staffing numbers, or were there particular times where pressure was put on you to reduce staffing? Um, there was a, there was always or, or always seemed to be pressures to reduce staff um, and an efficiency pro processes. You know, trying to make the system more e efficient. Um, so yes, there was a, a, a downward trend of staffing. Uh, um, it, in some of the times um, during peak times, you know, around the holidays, or, or we have term time staff working for us, we would have additional agency staff brought in to uh, supplement the, the the permanent resource that we had. Do you recall there being any analysis looking for trends or root causes of that large number of transaction corrections? Yes, there was, and there was documentation around it. So what what are the causes of these transaction corrections? Yes, and what kind of period? Was that throughout your time in office or in a particular period? I think we, we did it quite regularly, um, where... Um, when you look at the biggest numbers being um, cash, it's how can you get a branch to count the cash any different? Um, you know, putting secondary che checks in and things like that. For uh, areas such as lotteries, that's when the transaction acknowledgements came in. So rather than sending transaction corrections on all the product lines, we sent transaction acknowledgements because there tended to be timing delays or timing differences when the branch um, took the reports off the horizon terminal and put it in, uh, sorry, off the lottery terminal and put it into horizon versus when that lottery terminal actually closed down. So the post office side may shut at 5.30 but the lot and take a, a summary off Camelot, the Camelot terminal, but the terminal was still working up to seven, eight o'clock at night. So the, the figures were always different on a daily basis. So did, did anybody product. carry out any analysis, to your knowledge, uh, of the impact of software errors, for example, or, or on the percentage or number of transaction corrections that were being made or being requested? Not to my knowledge, no. The inquiries heard evidence of delays in the transaction correction process, in some cases where uh, the system uh, for a sub-postmaster was quite slow. Is that something you recognise at all? As in the Horizon system? No, it, it, the transaction correction system. So the, the ability um, to obtain a transaction correction. Yes, I, I, uh, I think when... We first went live in 2005. There were a lot of issues um, with the data that we that was being input into the Pulse Pulse app system, and there would, that led to delays in transaction corrections going going out. So there was a particular again. problem in 2005. I think I don't know if you heard Rod Ismay's evidence on that, but he. Um, raised concerns about, for example, egg timers on screens and things like that. Yeah, that, so that's more around the um, staff in Chesterfield um, have slow equipment. So it, it would take ages from to be able to issue a transaction correction, which then the productivity levels in the teams were very low 
because of the IT that Chesterfield had. And that's so a, 2000, a 2005 specific issue, is it, or is it a broader issue? No, it, it was a broader issue, um, and probably even around up to 2010, that there were issues with the kit that uh, Chesterfield were using. And was that addressed? It, it was, eventually, yeah. Um, they swapped out a lot of the computers within Chesterfield. And were you aware of other complaints from sub-postmasters uh, about delays in the transaction correction process? Um, I think if um, we, we used to do um, a KPI that, that said that we were issuing 95% of all transaction corrections within 60 days, sometime, which is still a long time. And, you know, everyone trying to get it, it closer to the 30 days. Um, but How long was the had, trading period? The trading period is, is a four or a five week period, period as such. So if it was 60 days, it would be quite significantly longer than the trading period? Yes. Yeah. Can we look at poll 00039028? This is a 2008 document. It's the operating level agreement. It's a draft version. I don't know if this is a document that you recall at all. If we scroll down and perhaps look over the, over the page. It doesn't really matter whether you saw this at the time or not, because I just want to take you to an indication of the kinds of times that certain processes uh, for transaction corrections seem to take. If we look at page yeah. six, we have there at 2.1, if we scroll down, transaction corrections issued by P and BA. And if we go over the page, 2.1.4, so slightly down, it addresses automated payment overpayments and personal banking overpayments. Uh, these have to be queried with the client and customer. A transaction correction will only be issued if the client and customer agrees, and these can take up to two years. Um, and then fraudulent cash checks below, it says their transaction corrections will be issued within four months of the transaction date. Um, so those are two cases where quite long periods seem to be recognised or inbuilt into the transaction correction process. Is that something you recall at all? I, I don't back then, because as I said, my teams weren't issuing transaction corrections, but um, on the 2.14, um, it all, it, if there was an over or an underpay, or usually an overpayment on the automated payment bill, say, um, it took the client to agree that we could, you know, adjust the the money and give the branch the money back. So if they overkeyed a bill, um, it needed client and customer agreement to get that money back. Um, I, I do find it quite astonishing that it, it it's documented there as up to two years. That does seem excessive. Um, so I think you did you say ninety percent or so would be within sixty days? Is that? 95%. 95% within 60 days, albeit you recognise that that in itself is quite a long period. And then yeah. the other 5%, in your experience, could they take significantly longer periods? They could, yeah. Uh, I think for automated payments, there was no open, open item. So the, there wasn't an open item that said, this is an aged item. The branch reported that they'd keyed something wrong we would then have to go to the clients to try and ret re um, retrieve the money. And so, the transaction would only be created once we'd got the money back from the client. So where particular information needs to be sought from the client, it could take significantly longer? Yes. Thank you. Or if, if a customer said um, they've got a banking item, um, you know, they believe they deposited X amount, but their account's only being credited with Y. So a client, a, a client, uh, a banking client, could come back to us to say, this is information we've got. 
you know, you've not credited our customer enough and they've got a receipt. And I think it, a lot of the issues were around the branch potentially had not put it through Horizon, but they'd stamped a paying in book or something like that. Um, a a lot of the things that you're mentioning are potential human errors, but where yeah. a complaint was made, for example, about a software error, um, typically, how long would a transaction correction take to be processed? Well, unless we knew about it, there wouldn't be one issued. So it needed to be flagged up to us that, that one would be needed as such. Flagged up by who? By whoever was dealing with the anomalies that were there. So the IT department needed to confirm that there was an issue that had caused uh, a financial issue. Um, typically, how long would, would it take for, the, for that team to get back to you? Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't potentially put a, a time scale on that. I think there's, there's only a few instances that I can remember. And I didn't necessarily deal with the detail of it, but there was um, a receipts and payments mismatch. And that was highlighted to us. And I think Rod and, and Andy Wynn dealt with it. But we were told there was an issue. And it was then looking at what is the financial impact of that. And I believe they went on to issue transaction corrections and right to branches. But I'm, I'm not that close to it that I understood all the issues that, that were raised. Thank you. We'll get to the receipts and payments issue shortly. Um, was there a system in place that allowed a sub-postmaster to know that a transaction correction would or would not be issued? Or was it simply a case of waiting and seeing? Um, in some instances, the branch, if they rang MBSC, we could, in product and branch accounting, accounting, could look to see if there was an open item ready to be issued and issue it, or it was a wait and see. So they, they might have a branch discrepancy and be ringing up to say, is there a transaction correction that's, that's going to come down the line and we would issue? And some of the evidence that the inquiry has heard um, concerns sub-postmasters trying to find out whether there would be a transaction correction and not receiving that information and having to wait and see. Uh, is that something that you recognise at all? Um, no, because I think if, if they'd been gone into MBSC and asked specifically for product and branch accounting, there should have been a, a response to that. Um, but might the response have been, we can't tell you just now? Um, if it was the same day that they balanced, we wouldn't be able to see the data now. Um, you've talked about but, uh, quite uh, long periods, up to 60 days for 95% of cases. Yeah. Um, it, it, if, if you called on day 30, for example, what would be the typical response? They should be able to see if there's a transaction or an open item they're waiting to be issued. Uh, and what do and you mean by an open item? an open item within the general ledger waiting for a transaction correction to be either investigated or and issued. Um, so if you phoned up on day 30 and you were told it was an open item, what kind yeah. of certainty would you have as to whether a transaction correction would or would not be issued? It, if it had been investigated or it, it, it was confirmed, you know, the branch said, I, I sent my checks off wrong or whatever, the team would confirm it and, and send the tr transaction correction out. But again, we're, we're dealing here in particular with things like software errors. If you had said that there was a software error and you call up, um, you haven't received a transaction correction and you were told it was an open item, would you have any certainty as to when, in fact, that would be dealt with? I, I don't think those two correlate as such or have done. So. The data that is in the system is what we what product, uh, product and branch accounting or, or trans, um, the staff within Chesterfield dealt with. They didn't they didn't get queries raised to say I've got a software issue. 
Are you saying that no sub-postmasters in the context of transaction corrections raised issues of software issues, of potential software issues? No. Not, not to do with transaction corrections is my belief, no. There may have been some issues or some issues in sending TCs out, but not uh, the Horizon system being at fault or a, a system issue in Horizon. So at no point while you were responsible for the transaction corrections process or for managing that process, were you aware of complaints about the Horizon system uh, that may or may not require a transaction correction? No. Only on a very few occasions. Do, do you in find which case were involved? Knowing what you know and how long you've been involved, and the fact that you were involved even um, in the early stages of the litigation, do you find that surprising that you were never informed about that? Yes. I, I think it's, if there were more uh, it, bugs, defects, etc., it were product and branch accounting and transaction processing joined up on that. I think we're struggling, what we may struggle to understand is how complaints about the Horizon system um, causing discrepancies discrepancies that required transaction corrections didn't reach uh, the person that was responsible for managing those transaction corrections. Uh, are you able to assist us at all with that? No, I think uh, only time, um, if, if a branch had got a branch discrepancy and they settled it centrally, they could raise it then that they believed that there, were, that there was an issue but it's what support we could give or what MBSC could give in trying to find out why there was a branch discrepancy. And during that investigation, presumably a transaction correction hadn't been issued? Uh, it could have been. And they, so the branch could have been issued a transaction corre correction for a debit. So you have not put this much cash in your till. They, if they then accepted that, so like the lotteries, they accepted a transaction correction for a £1,000, but they didn't put the cash in to the till, that would then, when they were balancing, form a £1,000 discrepancy that they then could put, settle centrally. And that happened on a, a, quite a few occasions. So the branch should have had a thousand pound sat in the retail till for the lottery, but they didn't transfer it into their horizon till. And if they accepted a transaction correction and didn't put the cash in, that would lead to a branch discrepancy. Thank you. I'll deal with the issue of discrepancies shortly. Um, yeah. Perhaps we'll, we'll move on to the suspense account because um, I think that addresses this particular issue. What did you understand a suspense account to be? As in a local suspense account yes. within, within the branch. Yes. I think it, it changed in 2005. So pre-2005, I'm, I'm led to understand that a branch could leave something in local suspense for a while, um, and it, it was authorised out in the regions, I think. Chesterfield didn't do the authorisation. Um, after 2005, the local suspense is still there on a, a weekly basis, but at branch trading on week four or five, they had to clear the local suspense and either put the cash in or settle the amount centrally. Thank you. Can I take so, you to your statement on this, just so that we can see a, a small, or perhaps maybe insignificant difference between the evidence that you, you're giving and the evidence of Susan Harding on this particular yeah. issue. It's WITN 06120100, <clears throat> and it's page 15. Thank 
Thank you. So paragraph 30, it says, Susan Harding states that the local suspense account, which had previously been available to sub-postmasters to hold losses until they removed them, is said to have been removed. Uh, the local suspense is actually still available to branches to use when they complete their daily slash weekly balance, but it's not available to hold losses or surpluses for long periods of time or on a permanent basis, as branches may have done previously. Um, so I think you are agreed that the essential, uh, with, with the essential point, that the impact program, in essence, meant that sub-postmasters were required to either accept the debt or cease trading um, when it came to the end of the trading period. And, and in that sense, they couldn't hold any money in a suspense account. Is that a fair summary? That's correct, yeah. They, they could settle the amount centrally. Yes. So they had to accept it or settle it centrally. Yeah. Or they had to stop trading, essentially. No, I mean, those were the, the only options. Well, they wouldn't... The, the, the option was that they didn't roll the branch trading statement. Which would have, in effect, oh, meant... Pardon? Which would, in effect, mean that they couldn't continue to trade. Well, they could trade, yeah, even without doing a branch trading statement. How could they do that? They'd have to... They just continued. Pardon? Just continued. Um, they'd have to continue... They I mean, the, the Horizon system would not let them continue if they didn't complete that... It, it did. So... There were branches that had not completed branch trading. So one of the controls within Chesterfield is to check after the branch trading period for the branch if there are items left in, in local suspense. If they are, that would indicate that the branch has not rolled their branch trading period. And that would begin your actions to begin debt recovery? No, that would um, it'd be an escalation route to get the branch to actually complete their branch trading. So where S Susan see. Harding says that the suspense account isn't actually a available at the end of the trading period, or at, le at least at the end of the trading period, is, is that wrong? I mean, wh where would you put these figures? Where would they go? No, it, it, it was it's available on a week but weekly basis. So I think Sue said that the local suspense was removed, and it wasn't removed. So over a, a, a trading period, a branch may, on the first week, have a surplus, and the second week have a, a loss, and they could be aggregated together to a net. But at the end of so that trading have, period, um, what was the, the option? Any discrepancies. If they're over £150, they could settle them centrally or make good the loss or take out the gain. And if they didn't do any of those options, what could they do? Could they, you, is your evidence that they could continue to trade despite that, if they did not, neither of those options? If they didn't complete a branch trading statement, but if they completed the branch trading statement, they had no option other than to either put the cash in, take the cash out, or settle centrally. If at the end of the branch trading, they continued then into another trading period and didn't put the cash in, it would be classified as a rolling loss. So a loss from one period into the next period. And such as the originally, they like the branch conformance team would check for rolling losses where a loss appeared to be getting larger and larger, but not declared. Thank you, that can come down. Um, so can I give you a, a scenario? If a postmaster had identified a cause of a discrepancy or, and was waiting for a transaction correction, but it hadn't yet been received, uh, could they complete their branch trading statement? Yes, but they'd have to declare a loss or a gain. So they could, they could say the thousand pound scenario I've got a difference at, end, at the end of my branch trading. I know it's going to be a transaction correction, and they could settle it centrally. And are they then... We were, 
putting themselves at risk of facing debt recovery action? Yes. Um, but if, if letters went out to postmasters on the um, amounts held in their customer account, and they could say, I'm waiting for a TC. And the, the, the operator who, who was dealing with the customer account could get in touch with the issuing teams to say, there's a transaction correction on this. Can we have it issued, please? And where a sub-postmaster hadn't completed their branch trading, did that instigate action uh, from your team to start investigating? Was that, was that one of the things that started an investigation? If, yes, if, if there, there was an item in local suspense after branch trading cutoffs, the uh, team would escalate it and find out is there a problem? Has the, has the branch shut down? Has there been a fire in branch? What is the reason for the, the um, non-completion of a branch trading statement? So, so they would potentially put it out into the network to ask questions, what's happening here, and monitor the levels that are in local suspense. So I think if, if I'm to understand correctly, um, your evidence is that you could continue trading but from that moment onwards, you would effectively be under investigation, or you would have triggered an investigation. Could have triggered one, yes. Thank you. Um, can we look at paragraph 32 of your statement? It's WITN 06120100. Yeah. And it's paragraph um, page 15, paragraph 32. So we're looking now at when that investigation has been triggered. Yeah. And this is uh, your description of what that investigation would involve. So you say there, um, the FSC investigation slash escalation would be focused on, and it sets out the various things it would be focused on. Uh, first, yeah. escalation to the network teams to enable branch training uh, to complete the branch trading statement. If we could scroll down. Understanding if there was a fundamental problem with the Horizon kit in branch and the branch was closed, for example, had it been permanently damaged in branch by a fire. Um, so one of the things that you would investigate is whether the kit was um, there was a fundamental problem. Am I right that that is intentionally distinguishing it from something like there being a software problem? I, I think it is, yeah, because it, it's quite fundamental if there was a fire in branch and it had destroyed the kit. Um, if the Horizon kit had been removed from the branch due to problems with the terminal and balances had not been completed, uh, FSC would not be involved in the reason why the kit had been removed or have investigated its removal. And then E, establishing if the branch had unexpectedly closed without balancing and network support or intervention was required. Um, yeah. So those are quite limited circumstances. Am I right in saying that none of your investigations involved the investigation of software issues as far as your department was concerned? I don't believe it did, no. Um, if the... If the terminal had been re re removed, it could be said that the, there, were, there were problems with the kit, but it wouldn't necessarily be um, that the, that was showing up to us. It, it was a case of we'd got an item in local suspense and it had not been cleared, but not the ins of and outs of if a terminal wasn't working, what was the matter with it and why had they had a swap out? And trying to get to the bottom of a discrepancy, for example, to enable you to issue a transaction correction, it doesn't seem that that was in any way part of that exercise that, that set out from A to D. No. Um, following an investigation, what were the options available? Was it a binary issue of issuing a transaction correction or not issuing a transaction correction? Not for local suspense, predominantly it was around getting the branch to roll the trading period to declare their own discrepancy. If um, 
it, it was caused by a fire or something else. There, there could be an option to write off the value and not pursue it. Um, or gaining intervention or training from the network to support the postmaster in completing a branch branch trading statement. But in terms of the transaction corrections, what were the options essentially you're going to we, get? We, we, we didn't issue, we didn't issue transaction corrections on local suspense. Putting aside the local suspense issue, um, just talking about your investigations, the investigations carried out by your team, can you assist us with um, what was the end result of that, of an investigation? Was it one of, we will issue a transaction correction or we won't issue a transaction correction? Was there anything in between? No, it, the transaction correction came about because of an open item on a general ledger. So they would issue if there was an open item, i.e. the two product streams didn't match, or they'd raised an inquiry and we'd receive money back from clients or banks to enable us to issue a transaction correction. Um, so it, it wasn't arbitrary, we'll, we'll just issue one. If you issued a transaction correction without there being an open item, it would create an, a, a, an open item on the ledger that needed action in. And what would be the next step from there? If they did, uh, did issue one, if they didn't issue one? If they didn't issue one, it would be an open item that would be monitored at our weekly, weekly meetings. Why has it not been cleared or issued? Um, can I look at paragraph 36 of your witness statement? It's WITN 06120100. And there's a passage in there that I'd just like your assistance with. It's about halfway down. It says, a postmaster could dispute a transaction correction even if they had accepted slash settled centrally the transaction correction, uh, which would usually have been due to branch trading time constraints. Um, when, when you say branch trading time constraints, do you mean the, the need to enter the next trading period, or is that something else? Yes. Um, so if they received a transaction correction two days before branch trading, they didn't investigate it, they could um, settle it centrally and then request, um, when, when the team rang up or when the team sent the letters around, um, you have this transaction correction on your account, they could say, but I want to dispute it. You then say that a relationship manager could block the debt. Can you, can you assist us with blocking the debt and what that means? So if, if a postmaster had settled an item centrally, there was a blocking option to say, do not chase on this debt. So if somebody had said, um, I'm going to dispute this, there was a, a blocking code put on the line within the customer account and the, the, the debt wasn't chased. So a blocking would occur, am I right in, in thinking, only if an investigation was taking place? Yes. Um, and for those reasons we saw earlier, the investigations that were carried out by your team were, were rather limited. That was local sus suspense. That was totally different to transaction corrections. Okay, thank you very much. So in terms of transaction corrections, what was... Yeah. What kind of investigations would take place in relation to software, uh, alleged software errors? I don't, I don't see correlation between that. Well, if a sub postmaster said that there is a discrepancy due to a software error, um, in what circumstances would their debt be able to be blocked if there was no investigation into that software error? So if um, the Postmaster came back to us and said, this transaction correction is incorrect, I believe the horizon figure is incorrect, then Andy, the relationship manager... Is that Mr Wynn? Would, Mr Wynn, yeah, would take that up and try and get it resolved with uh, the IT suppliers. Um, were you involved in that process at all? Not, not in the nitty-gritty of it, no. All... 
all Andy's disputes that came in were in writing so that we understood what the, the postmaster was trying to convey the issue was. So every so time every there was a software issue raised by a sub-postmaster, that would be in writing? No, you, it's a totally different thing to a transaction correction. Well, if somebody's seeking a transaction correction, would like a transaction correction because there's a discrepancy caused by a software error. How would they know it's caused by a software error? Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll absolutely come to that. Yeah, and that's, I think that's where I'm struggling because the team in Chesterfield were just processing the data that they'd got. So what had come in from Horizon and what had come in from clients? If the... If a postmaster said that Camelot data is incorrect, I keep this into Horizon or whatever, we would go back to Camelot for evidence that that's what had happened on that terminal. But it wouldn't be a software issue. So if they said there is an error there in the Camelot issue, um, I yeah. think it's down to a software error, would they be able to block the debt or not? But I don't believe it would be down to a software error. If, if, if How do you reach that conclusion? Keyed, if, if they'd not cut keyed the amount into Horizon, from the end of day, Camelot slip, there would have been differences between what Camelot said they completed on that terminal versus what the postmaster input into the Horizon till. So am I right in thinking that as part of the transaction correction process, so far as your department was concerned, software errors just didn't feature in that process? I don't think it did greatly, no. Um, and the level of disputes that we had on transaction corrections were very low. Thank you, sir. That might be an appropriate time to take our mid-morning break. Yeah, OK. Could, could we come back at half past 11? Yes, certainly. Um, so feel free to have a wander around wherever you are, Ms. Bolsover, and thank just you. come back by 11.30, all right? Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Can you see and hear me? I can, thank you, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to the topic of recovery of debts. Can you assist us with um, what, if any, legal experience uh, those who were charged on a day-to-day -day basis with recovering debts had? No. Um, can we look at poll 00084996, please? This is a presentation from 2009. If we go over to page two, can you, do you recall this workshop at all? I Sorry. think I do, yes. Do, what were the circumstances? If we go back to page one then. Sorry, it might assist. Do you remember the purpose of it? Uh, yeah, I think it was around the efficiency program to reduce staffing levels um, within Chesterfield. And if we go over the page, um, there's a heading there, legal skills, on the left-hand side, and it says, determine the legal skills required by product and branch accounting for managing debt recovery processes, and it has your name next to it. Yeah. Can you assist us with that? Um, I, I think it was highlighted as a... There was a gap there that the team were there to process... Uh, information and recover, recover the debt amount, but didn't have the legal skills or terminology. So if solicitors were coming back to the team with a long-winded email, they didn't always understand the terms. And I believe the um, steps taken was workshops with, and I can't remember whether it was um, uh, Bon Dickinson or other uh, legal, legally qualified people to do workshops with the team to enable them to gain an understanding of the processes um, 
for uh, moving to civil recovery. We've heard some evidence of the size of the legal team being reduced at the post office. Uh, would this be around this time or was that some other time to your recollection? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, we, we, we were gaining input or passing cases to the Royal Mail legal team um, to pursue debt recovery. So it, it, at the point of we can't, we can't recover this debt, then we would see legal support to then chase the debt until legal services, Royal Mail and, and Post Office split. And then work was undertaken by myself and I think Rebecca Mantle to set down what steps should be taken and to gain a um, fixed price, pricing as such for the work that needed undertaking. Thank you. Sticking with this document, we see there Mandy Talbot's name mentioned quite a lot. Um, solicitor service improvements. She's to create a checklist of evidence required by solicitors. Um, solicitor service improvements, develop standard checklist of information provided to solicitors. Um, if we keep on going over the page, we see your name mentioned together there. Use of local solicitor services, investigate viability of using local solicitors, i.e. for low-value debt, uh, where it's uneconomical to pursue the debt using existing external solicitors. Um, what did you understand Mandy Talbot's role to be? Um, she was, she was uh, the internal um, lawyer as such that, that we went to. Uh, her name is mentioned quite a lot. Are we to read into that any particular level of responsibility that she may have had on a policy side or taking I, I'm unaware of that. Um, I, all, all she was seen as is another interface for us to then gain support to recover the debt. So from a legal aspect, sending um, letters before action out, etc., and or pa passing on to um, an external solicitor uh, solicitor but something like investigating the viability of using local solicitors which you're both tasked as the lead role um yeah in carrying out that kind of work did you see mandy talbot as, as simply a case worker who handled cases or something else she was a touch point for us so i, d I didn't really know her position as such did you did she give you any indication that, that didn't happen um we didn't I think there was some suggestion that we would put cases into, of a low value into court ourselves, and of which I said that wasn't feasible. You know, we weren't experienced in, in lodging claims for, for money, not within Chesterfield. Ignoring that particular issue, um, did was Mandy Talbot someone who you saw as having decision-making power or, or something else? I, I did, yeah. Uh, from a, a legal aspect, yes. And, and how about from a policy aspect or something slightly wider than a legal aspect? I, I don't know. Thank you. That can come down. Um, I want to ask you about the, I think it's the Dunning process. Is that correct? It's set out in your witness statement? Yeah. Can you briefly tell us what the Dunning process is? Um, once a, a debt is created on Pulsat, so if, if a postmaster settled centrally a transaction correction or a branch discrepancy, the dunning process started one week, automated one week after branch trading, letters would be sent and statements to the branch to say this debt is outstanding. So it was done over three letters. I believe, um, one seven days after branch trading and then one 21 days after branch trading. I, I think it might, that, that's it for the current agents, there was two. And if we'd got either no response from the, the branch or the postmaster or they point blank refused to pay, rang us up and said they weren't prepared to pay it, 
the debt would be referred to the contracts advisors. So when we spoke before the break about um, the impact programme, etc., and um, the fact that a sub-postmaster would settle centrally, um, even in cases where they considered that the discrepancy was caused by a software error, that would then trigger this process where they'd be sent a letter within a week. If the debt was set on the customer account, which was the individual to the to the branch and postmaster, then the letters would say to contact us and discuss it, or um, and discuss it with the the agent that was that was dealing with that debt. Uh, but if they just point blank either didn't didn't respond, then it would be passed to the contracts advisor to discuss it over the telephone with the, with the uh, postmaster. And you, I think you said there were three different letters. Were, were they increasing in escalation? As such, yes. Yeah, You've, we've not heard from you. Uh, they, they were rewritten. The letters were rewritten as part of the, I believe, the branch uh, efficiency programme. So there, there was different word input in each letter. When you say rewritten, to become more or less... Uh, confrontational, aggressive, or...? Uh, potentially less, uh, but I'm, I'm unsure whether that, that actually happened. The letters were passed through um, legal and um, communications teams, so... Uh, you described in your statement there are separate processes for current agents and former agents. Very briefly, can you tell us the differences? Yeah. Well, we, we couldn't then depend... If it was a former agent that had left the business, then there was no contact via the contracts managers. So it, it was the same dunning process, letters sent out at, at different intervals, and then it might be a third letter, which was a letter before action. So it, we could potentially be pursuing civil recovery. In respect of writing off debts, in what circumstances would debts be written off during this process? The, for the former agents. For, for either. Um, if um, if um, um, an, an administrator said there was an issue with the debt and they would document the issues raised and request a write-off by their team leader and it was done on an authority level. So if there were, there were problems identified, then the individual could pass it to the team leader or to myself to seek authority to write off. Problems identified by who? By the branch calling the current agent's team or the, the, the former agent's team being unable to trace the... Um, former sub postmaster, they could put recommendations in to, to write off because it wasn't viable to pursue. So we have a circumstance where they can't be traced. That's one case in which it would be written off. Uh, can you give us some more examples of circum typical circumstances where debts would be written off? Um, if we'd gone into using a, a solicitor, they, they might say that this is not worth pursuing. Um, there's no assets, so it's to, you would only be securing a judgment for judgment's sake. I think it was later that we determined this is, you know, it, it's it, we're spending an awful lot of money trying to to get something back for what um, to no gain. So that process was reviewed, but I can't remember the date it was reviewed. Um, but it, it could be that um, it's going to cost you this much to pursue this debt. Um, are you prepared to spend that much? So we, so have, we have can't trace. We have effectively a waste of the post office's money to pursue. Uh, yeah. any, any other circumstances? Or oh, not economical to pursue. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, there could be varying scenarios. It, it depends what came up, you know, what, what circumstances there were. Um, in, in your experience or to your recollection, 
at this stage, so the dunning process stage, prior to it moving to solicitors, um, how often would a debt be written off in the case of, for example, a sub-postmaster who complained about uh, a software error with Horizon? I think prior to the court case, we had very little escalation that it was Horizon or software issues. Um, it was only after the judgment, the um, Alan Bates um, litigation, that we got people saying it was Horizon. So there were very few numbers, I believe, prior to that. I, I, can't, I can't give you numbers on how many were written off. The, the stats would all be there um, on the values that we, we wrote off each month and each write-off would be backed up with a reason and a paper round it of why we should write this debt off. So would there be a statistic that could tell us how many debts were written off uh, because sub-postmasters had raised complaints about the software? No. Uh, I don't believe so. And your experience was that it wasn't until the uh, Bates and others group litigation that people were making complaints about the software that were escalated no, to your team? No, because I believe um, the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance, um, that started raising the initial issues. Um, and then there were MPs cases, mediation cases. So there were various places that things were coming in. And we were asked, is there debt on these accounts? And we would then feed back, we've got this debt, and we will be told to hold uh, recovery. And again, put a blocking a block on, on the debt if we were told that there was an issue. Do you find it surprising now, given what you now know, um, that during your time in this role, nobody said that as part of the Dunning process, as part of that uh, increase in escalation um, to recover funds, people, weren't, people were raising bugs, errors or defects or software problems with Horizon. Is it surprising to you that that didn't reach you, that message? Yes. And why do you think that is? I don't know, in all honesty. I don't... Um, we had very few you know, say that if, if, if we were told it was this, then we would investigate. But at, for my recollection, I can't remember that happening. And I think I've said in my statement, I, I'm very surprised that the evidence given to say Fujitsu were amending uh, branch postmasters' accounts. I had that, the facility that, to amend postmasters. Had the facility, yes, and I think I I think I potentially knew something could be done, but it was under a controlled process. But if, so if there they, were, if there was a pattern of complaints during this recovery process, where sub postmasters were saying, I, "I know you're saying X equals Y, or X should equal Y," but in fact. The, the numbers there are wrong, and, and it's because of the Horizon system. Um, and that simply wasn't reaching you any kind of pattern or trend. Well, I mean, what's gone wrong there? The, uh, the communication from wherever it's being reported. So if, if there was a financial loss, or they wanted um, a transaction correction, say, and, and, and proved that there was a system issue, then the communication lines appear to have broken. All of those administrative officers who are dealing with the transaction corrections process, those who are dealing with the recovery process, um, you were their manager. Yeah. Were they not raising these issues with you? They were asked to if they were, if, if they were being raised to the individuals, yeah. Were you so having we regular have... meetings at which those topics were raised? Um, I can't think of regular meetings, but I know internally with the legal services team, Roderick Williams, etc., we had discussions on the cases that we held or if a 
postmaster raised it that it was an horizon issue it was fed over to legal uh, and your evidence is that that was exceptionally rare um yeah i i think the biggest chunk of work was the justice for sub postmasters and that was around former agents debt that we raised we 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 were told which postmasters it was that had raised it and we sent copies of the files that we held over to legal services if we held the file. Prior, so we we'll, add. Sorry, we'll, we'll get to, to, to all of those documents, but prior to the Justice for Sub Postmasters campaign, um, can you recall debts ever being written off um, in respect of a sub postmaster who said that the debt w was actually just an apparent debt that was caused by uh, a bug error or defect or software failure with Horizon? No, it doesn't stick in my mind that that, that was raised, no. And it doesn't stick in your mind that it was ever written off? They, they may have been written off, but we, we sought reasons for debts to be written off. Uh, and so, nowhere to your recollection prior to that campaign was a debt written off because of a complaint about a bug error defect or other software issue with Horizon? Not, not to my knowledge, unless we'd been requested to write a debt off. So within the business, people could come to us and say, please write these, these figures off because of X, Y, and Z. And that was the, the part of the case that, that we used to control the write-off. And you were the manager of this team, and yep. to the best of your knowledge and recollection, you don't recall anyone coming to you and saying, I have written off this debt, or can this debt be written off, because the sub-postmaster is complaining uh, about the Horizon system and there might be something in it. I, I can't say that there would be ne ne none. I, I, I just can't reco recollect any. And I've said prior to the Justice for Sub Postmasters campaign, how about after? When, when was the first case that you can recall that was actually written off during this um, pre-litigation phase um, due to uh, an allegation about the Horizon system? I think during the mediation uh, sessions that happened, we were requested to write this debt off. So... so are we talking 2013, 2015, 2018? 13, I think. Uh, so we would be advised, don't pursue this debt, please write it off. Uh, and was that the first period, really, when you became aware of issues? I, we didn't, I didn't necessarily know what the issues were. We, we weren't privy to the uh, mediation sessions that happened or the reasons for it. We were just told, this is a mediation case, please write it off under the authority of Angela. Thank you. Where debts weren't written off, I think you've said in your statement that you would then liaise with the lawyers. Uh, and Mandy Talbot is a name that you've mentioned in particular. Uh, we would liaise on the case, um, on the pursuit of it, if there was no recovery from it, then it would potentially go for a write-off as a write-off recommendation and be written off if it wasn't worth pursuing or unable to pursue. But at some point during that dunning process, the lawyers would become involved. Where, where which stage was that? Uh, after we'd sent two, at least two letters out to the branch uh, to the post ex postmaster, and then I if think. We <laughs> And then I think you say there was a pre-action letter was the third letter, is that right? Yeah. Uh, was that drafted by Mandy Talbot and the legal team? I believe it was in the early days pre the split of Royal Mail. Um, can we look at poll 00006650? This is a, the interview with Womble Bond Dickinson that I've already taken you to, and I'd like to look at page 30 of that. I'm afraid I'm going to read a fair bit of this transcript. I'm going to start at the bottom of page 30. Um, 
So VB is, is the interviewer, Victoria Brooks, and AB is yourself. She says, uh, we talked a bit, and now I need to know a bit about civil claims and recoveries action, uh, which is definitely more you, and you say, yep. And she says, we've talked about the procedure for her bringing a claim, uh, so is it, it's basically a commercial decision as to whether or not you bring a claim based on whether or not you think they're going to get the money back. Um, over the page. Uh, you say, yeah, in the past, we've always gone judgment if we can. If we think we've got a good enough case, we've gone for judgment. Uh, and she says, and was that always the commercial decision about whether uh, you get the money back, or was it more? Was it more because sometimes um, I think about the post office specifically, but some clients are like, no, they owe us money, we're going for the judgment, doesn't matter about the cost, and someone will be like, uh, you know, we're not actually going to get money at the end of it, so we're not going to do that. Uh, does that change? And then you say, I think we've uh, been swayed by this action. Uh, and, and can you just assist us with that? What, what do you mean there? I, I think in the past we, di we did go for judgment, irrespective of whether there were any... Um, it, it would come to fruition on a payment. Um, but it, it became, in, in my view, uneconomical to, to go for judgment on some of the cases um, because it was costing us too much to do that. So where you describe it before is a, a commercial, basically a commercial decision. Was that the core to your thinking in, in respect of um, actions? that they were ultimately commercial decisions and to be approached in that way? Yes. Um, she says, OK, and you say, uh, into not doing it. Uh, so you used to just go for it all the time. Uh, if we would go for judgment, um, and I would say 95% of the time uh, would get into the default, so it's then you've got it on record. Yeah, we've got an option of, and then something years. Um, so. Was was some was it important to get a judgment and to get a finding on record against the sub postmaster? I, I think that was the view um, in the early days. Yes. Um, and we got some le leverage if they got a job, attachment of earnings, etc. Uh, yeah. And if they got prop uh, property, you're definitely yeah. Uh, to try and get it secured, even if they've got kids in there or whatever. And by this time, we've had um, changes come to fruition after 30 years, really, um, which uh, we didn't know we got. So Royal Mail used to put charges on. Oh, right. And now we're having to ask them to lift this charge. Uh, we also have people dying and no charge uh, change and debt not being paid. Uh, so there were a case the other week. He died in 2009. The family have just continued, uh, so they can't something, anything. Uh, so they didn't sell the property or prove the will or whatever uh, they'd have needed to do and then. Um, why, I don't know. So why they've done nothing for you, uh, nothing from a, you know, I don't know. I find it very interesting. Uh, that's very interesting. Yeah. And I did want to go for more than Roderick wanted to go. Uh, yeah, laughs. Uh, he looks quite happy uh, with himself for 120,000, I think. Was this the, the attitude towards sub postmasters and recovery of debts in terms of, um, I mean, for example, there's reference there to try and get secured even if they've got kids. Uh, there seems to be a, a slight lack of sympathy in, in the approach that's taken. Do, do you agree with that? Potentially, yeah. It, it was a debt that was outstanding to the business, a loss. Can we go on to page 33, please? And about halfway down, uh, the interviewer says, um, what involvement does your team have with actually, uh, if at all, looking at the contracts when they're considering recovering shortfalls from either formal or current postmasters? Uh, do they ever look at the actual contracts for those individual postmasters? Or is it more of a, this is our process based on those contracts? 
Uh, and you say, all contracts say they should pay the losses, and she says they do. Uh, so irrespective of which contract they've got, they should be paying the losses. Uh, fine, that's fine. Uh, I thought that would be the answer, but um, uh, we would. We would gain a copy of contract and have it uh, in the file from the former agent's point of view, yeah. But from the current agent's point of view, they owe us the money. Uh, yeah. Um, and she says, and it doesn't really make a great deal of difference because, and you say, what, the con what contract uh, they are on now. And she says, okay, so looking at the contracts and probably more uh, what the contract advisors don't do if it's more of a problem that might justify suspension or termination, but other than what you're doing, uh, because you're right, uh, they do all say that in one way or another um, that you've got to pay the money back. Do you recognize that that isn't actually correct in terms of all, I mean, you've said there all contracts say they should pay the losses, uh, and the interviewer says uh, in one way or another they've got to pay the money back. Uh, do you... I think. It's only come to light to me since watching some of the um, testimonies that, that have, have come on um, through the through the um, inquiry. I think the viewpoint was that all losses should be paid, and I do take it that you know if, if they were caused by software issues, then they are not caused by the branch. But I think the view from a business point of view, was the debt was there and it was owed. Um, and the team that we had were processing debts. And if we look at poll 00000246, please, and page seven, well, if we start at the first page to see what it is we're looking at, it's the, co the, the community sub-postmaster's contract. And if we look at page 71, if you've seen other evidence, you may well have seen witnesses being taken to this particular paragraph, it's paragraph 12, which says the sub-postmaster is responsible for all losses caused, uh, and then it limits it through his own negligence, carelessness, or error, and also for losses of all kinds caused by his assistance. Uh, deficiencies due to such losses must be made good without delay. So do you recognize looking at that and looking at your account in the, in the 2018 interview uh, that in fact uh, the suggestion um, that was made in that, in that interview was in, in fact wrong in terms of all losses uh, are payable. I, I do now. I don't necessarily think it, it, was, it was thought that way previously. And if we... I think that, that was a, you know, one, one um, paragraph covered all losses because they were committed as such through a branch discrepancy by the branch um, themselves or a transaction a cor a correction being accepted and settled centrally, creating the debt. Um, I think you may have seen me take um, Mr. Inward to the next document. It's poll 00113670. This is a document that you'll be familiar with. It's the Operators in Service Debt Policy. Um, yeah. Your name is on, on the front there as a key stakeholder, um, approved by Mr. Inward. I think you've said that you actually worked on this policy to some extent. Yeah. Um, and if we look at page four, did you see me take Mr. Inward to, to this particular document? Yeah. So it's paragraph four, and it describes there from a purely contractual perspective, uh, the operator of a post office branch is responsible for, and then the first one, making good any loss of post office cash and stock without delay. Uh, and can you see there how that error and that approach um, seems to be included in this particular policy? Yeah. Can we please look now at NFSP 00000043, please? Um, this, I, I believe, is a draft policy in 2004. If we could go over the page to page two. Uh, we see they're reviewed, and, and your name is in the reviewed section. It's called Debt Recovery Horizon Related Errors. And if we look at the objective on page three, please, 
We see there it says the objective of our debt recovery process is to achieve a 100% success rate in proven charge errors brought to account and made good. The only exceptions will be where there's been a dispute that on investigation has been upheld or as referenced in the liability for losses policy, uh, agreement has been given by the retail line representative to write off the loss uh, to their profit and loss accounts. So where we're past the Dunning process, uh, the, the approach is to try and achieve a 100% success rate. Is that something that you would agree with, is something that you recall? Well, this was in 2004 that this document was written. Yes. So but is that that's a... where I would struggle because I don't, I don't know the processes for debt recovery back in 2004. But I, think... I appreciate that I'm on the circular of this but it wasn't within my remit. Is that an approach that is consistent with the approach that occurred throughout your time when it was within your remit, that the approach was in reality for a 100% success rate? No, because we, we, couldn't, receive, we couldn't achieve 100% success rate for all debt. But the objective of the debt recovery process is to achieve a 100% success rate. Is that something that you subscribe to during your time? No. Wait, I never had that as an objective, no. Can we look at poll 00088867, please? Uh, this is the liability for losses policy. It's a 2003 version. It's a document that I've taken some witnesses to previously, and it's page eight that I'd like to look at, which refers to horizon issues. Um, it says there, if an agent feels that an error has occurred via the horizon system, it's essential that this be reported to the horizon system help desk. The Horizon System Help Desk will only consider the incident for further investigation if the branch has evidence of a system fault. If no evidence is available, uh, the case will not be investigated and the agent will be held responsible for making good the loss. Um, so it's only going to be investigated if the sub-postmaster can produce evidence of a system fault. Um, am I right in saying then that we have the Horizon System Help Desk there that won't investigate unless the branch can uh, evidence a system fault. I think in respect of your team and their processes, they didn't see it as part of their job to investigate um, an alleged software fault either. Well, I don't think they were told about it, no, because they were sending transaction corrections out. This is 2003, so it's prior to um, the poll, poll SAP system. But were you aware whilst you were the head of, of the team that the help desk was only considering an incident where the sub-postmaster themselves had evidence of a system fault? No, prior to the inquiry sending me the paperwork, I've never seen this document from 2003. Thank you. Were you aware of any particular team then that was investigating system faults that were raised by sub-postmasters, uh, but sub-postmasters didn't, who didn't have evidence of such a fault? Not necessarily, no. I, I think it, it should have gone in to service delivery area if there was a, an issue. Uh, should have gone in, in, into who and where? I, where? So there, there was an IT help desk within, I think, service delivery that should have raised any issues. And if there were financial impact, then should have been engaging with um, either Rod in the, Rod is me in the first level or whichever senior manager were managing the area with the, where the system was deemed at fault. And as part of your debt recovery actions, uh, nowhere in, in your experience did you receive the product of an investigation that had evidenced a system fault uh, that meant that you had to stop the debt recovery action? No, other than the, the one that's um, 
I'm, I am aware of the um, uh, receipts and payments misbalance. But it didn't create a debt, but it did show as an overall loss in in branch. Then, other than that one, no. Um, and and that's I think that's probably one of the first times that I, I think we were engaged in. There's an issue here. Thank you. Um, if that could come down, could, could we bring onto screen your witness statement? WITN zero six one two zero one zero zero. It's page 21, paragraph 46. And it's here in your statement that you talk about the system issues raised by branches to the NBSC. Yeah. And I think you explained it in this way. You say, um, if at the bottom, thank you very much. Um, FSC worked with the NBSC if multiple branches raised the same queries. Uh, some of those, just pausing there, um, did you have a system in place to record the fact that multiple branches were raising the same queries? NBSC would come into um, FSC, yes. But it wasn't something that FSC itself kept any record of? or uh, No. Some of those... Some of these were referred to as system issues, and these would be escalated to the post office IT service desk and onto uh, the IT suppliers, uh, and you said ATOS slash Accenture for investigation. And you've given examples there. Um, first, non-arrival of uh, TAs in branch for lottery or pay station. Um, over the page. I think my point on this one was they were, they were classified as system errors where they weren't arising system errors. It was around the data going out to branches Indeed. that was an issue. So, so as far as you were concerned with system errors, in, in fact, they are to do with the transaction authorizations and transaction corrections and not to do with the broader horizon system. Is that correct? Transaction acknowledgements, yeah. Yes. Uh, and it's only at page, uh, paragraph 49, so if we go down the page where you, you talk about the receipts and payments issue. Yeah. You say, uh, there are only a few occasions that I can remember that I came across branch trading problems due to what uh, may now be referred to as a horizon bug, although I do not remember it being called a horizon bug at the time. I believe uh, that these were uh, for receipts and payments mismatch issues. I am, however, afraid that I cannot recall the details of these as the issues were managed by Rod Ismay uh, and Andrew Wynn. I was not aware of widespread issues or names for horizon bugs at the time. Um, the IT service management help desk would need to be contacted uh, to give details of these issues. Uh, their specific cause and resolution um, that was supported by the FSC. Was this recorded in some way by your team at the time? Uh, first of all, can we start by saying, wh when was this time? Uh, it's quite an important issue for this inquiry uh, to know when it was that you became aware of the receipts and payments mismatch issues. I can't put an exact time on it. On it, I, I want to say 2013, 14, but I, I don't know. Um, if this was reported into us from the IT service help desk, then Rod, I believe, took the lead on it with Andy um, to understand what the issues were and what should be done about it. And I think the conclusion to this issue, I, I don't know how it was resolved with the system, what went wrong or what they did to um, make it right. I do remember, though, that I think if it caused a loss in branch, this mismatch, then we issued the branch with a credit TC so they didn't stand for loss. And if they, it, it created a surplus, I believe in the letter that Rod and Andy sent out, it said that we would not be seeking to recover the surplus. Um, 
but I can't honestly remember whether it was around 20 officers or how big it was. And how would that information be shared amongst those who are dealing with transaction corrections? The, this wasn't a transaction correct, correction issue. It wasn't an open item, but it was flagged up as a misbalance of the account. But you've said that they would issue, for example, credit transaction corrections as a result of this. Give the branch cash back, yes. Yes, a buyer and a transaction correction. Yeah, so they issued them the credit that potentially this misbalance caused. Absolutely. So if there was a misbalance of £1,000, I believe the, that a cash transaction correction was issued to them to accept, to negate the loss that they had occurred on their account. And we began today talking about the various people at Administrative Officer Grade who were dealing with transaction corrections. Um, this does seem to have resulted in a transaction correction in certain cases. Was there a process by which information about the receipts and payments mismatch issues was cascaded down to those administrative officers who are dealing day to day with transaction correction issues? I don't believe so, no. Because they wouldn't hit the GLs that the, the individuals were working on. They were separate product GNL, GL accounts, general ledger accounts. Uh, and why do you say that? How can you say that with any confidence? Well, I, I suppose I can't. Um, but to, to my knowledge, it didn't affect the product lines. I don't know what the bug created. I know the transactions didn't match the cash. So the receipts in and the, the payments receipts out didn't match with the cash in branch. Uh, and do you think that the fact that the transactions didn't ma match the cash, I mean, I think you said that 95% or something of uh, your transaction corrections related to cash. Um, cash but, Yes. Was it not information that was important for those dealing with transaction corrections to be aware of? Um... I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't believe so at the time, no. Knowing what you know now, do you believe so? N not necessarily within the individual product teams, no. This is the, I think, the only issue that you say you're aware of that meant that X didn't necessarily mean Y in terms of the numbers that were being shown um, in the accounts. Um, to use... I think you, we spoke about a Camelot issue earlier, for example. To use that issue, um, that a sub-postmaster's horizon figure and the Camelot figures, if they weren't the same, what would happen in those situations? Was this something that those dealing with transaction corrections should have been aware of? In the early days, if there was a Camelot transaction correction sent out, it was... Um, Horizon says this, you've, you've been put Horizon as this, and Camelot data says this. Yes. And it might, with the Camelot transactions, I believe, it was done over a full month. So it could, the branch could be up one day, down the next, et cetera, and it was netted out over a, probably a 30-day period until for the online game, the, it went to transaction acknowledgements. So the position that was being considered was does X equal Y, but there was no factoring into that the possibility that a bug error or a defect, a bit like the receipts and payments mismatch issue, might have featured in there somewhere. Um, I suppose it could have done, yeah. Um, but it, it's the postmaster that's inputting the, uh, the lottery figure into Horizon. Well, again, how can you be sure that the figure that you are seeing is the figure, in fact, that the postmaster was inputting? If there was a difference and we'd issued a transaction correction, he would be able to challenge it, but it would be down to the slip from the lottery terminal as well. You're looking at two pieces of paper and seeing whether they match. Uh, but, yeah. in fact, if the, one of the pieces of paper shows an incorrect figure because of a bug, error or defect you simply wouldn't be aware of that, would you? 
other than there's a difference from what the client's saying that that, that had been transacted on the lottery terminal. Uh, and you generally took the view that that was probably something like a miss key. Yes. Uh, I, I think it was more around the lottery slip on the terminal on the retail side of the business being taken at the wrong time and it being inputted into Horizon before the close of business on the Camelot terminal. If you stand back now, though, and, and really think about it and think about the fact that you knew about uh, a bug that could cause a mismatch between receipts and payments, looking back at the work that those people who were dealing with transaction corrections were dealing with, do you think it would have been useful for them to have known that the Horizon system was capable of causing a mismatch of some sort rather than it being down to user error? It, it may have been, but I think these were, as I've just said, probably 20 branches with the receipts and payments mismatch versus 125,000 transaction corrections going out a year. I think I said that you couldn't be sure about those figures, and I think you accepted that you couldn't be sure about those figures of the numbers of branches affected by receipts and payments mismatches. Well, I just I said it earlier that I think it was maybe around the 20 mark, this, this incident. Did you carry there. out an investigation into the Horizon system to identify if it was only 20 branches? No. Uh, no. That information went to Rod and Andy, I believe, on a spreadsheet of these are the offices that it involves. D does it strike you that a system that is capable of a receipts and payments mismatch issue might also be capable of another issue affecting figures in a different way? I, I suppose it could have been, yeah, but I, I wasn't aware of it. And do you think that the system, the fact that the system was capable of such an issue uh, was something that should, in fact, have been cascaded down to those who are dealing with transaction corrections? Maybe it should have been. I, I don't know. Um, I want to address perhaps cascading upwards now. Um, before I do, can you just tell us why Rod Ismay and Andrew Wynn, why were they managing the receipts and payments issue in particular? I don't know. I just know that it, uh, Andy was involved with Rod when this was raised as an issue. Um, can we look at poll 00001538, please? This is a major incident management process document, and it sets out different levels of uh, management within the post office. If we look at page seven, it sets out level two, post office limited business protection team. It's at the bottom of page seven. Uh, this team consists of empowered business representatives from across post office limited. Uh, these business area experts are available at all times and will be used to support, inform and influence the management of a medium slash high severity incident. Um, am I right in saying that you are one of the empowered business representatives? Yes, I was. If we look at uh, page 22, please. Uh, we see there the members of this team. And if we scroll down, your name appears about three quarters of the way down. Yeah. I think Rod was the lead on it, so he was highlighted in bold. Yes. And I was the sort of deputy if Rod wasn't there or, or we both were on the call. Was this the kind of forum where those kinds of issues could be discussed and shared? Uh, yes. If there was a major incident, major power outage or something, uh, a call would be put out to all the people on the list, I believe, at, at that time. So saying there was a business protection team call at 11 o'clock. So everybody dialed in within this remit to determine what the impact of the issue was. And, and I'm not necessarily saying it's bugs and defects, but it was any in major incident or that was classified as a major incident. We have Rod Esme listed above you there. 
Um, <coughs> you say you're not saying it was bugs, errors, and defects necessarily. What, was it ever bugs, errors, and defects in this group? Do they? Do you recall any discussions of that nature? No. And this is a 2009 document. Can you assist us with how long um, you were on this team and how long Rod Ismay was on this team? I don't know. Uh, would it, know would it likely have been during your, your time as a man, in a managerial role you sat in this team? Yes, it would. Um, they, they, even to me leaving, you know, at the point of leaving, they could still be like a... Uh, business protection type meeting called if there was an issue so if um mbsc were raising an issue there's a problem here there could be a call put out for people to go on the call to understand the impact of any issues that were being raised and you don't recall so, for example mbsc ever raising the issue of software issues with horizon amongst this group no i don't I'd like to now move on to knowledge of bugs, errors, and defects in the system. Uh, can we look at poll 00006650? That's the document that we've looked at quite a few times. It's the Womble Bond Dickinson interview, and it's page 38 that I'd like to look at. Uh, so the bottom of page 38, You say there, um, you're asked, and, and really interesting, um, as I'm someone, somebody who's done a lot of post office work over the years, as well as uh, um, it's really interesting to meet people and hear what actually happens, um, it's been uh, really useful. And then you say, I think in any case, I'll sort of say that we something were Lee Castleton, and Lee Castleton's evidence is sat in a box in office and it's this big. If we go over the page, please. Uh, really? My boss, uh, who I work with in Bristol, Stephen Dilley, he did that case with Lee. Um, so I remember that being an interesting case at the time. And that was really, was it? Important case uh, of a bit of uh, a judgment that um, to do with signing off the accounts and the meaning uh, of what uh, that was. So, you know, that was, um, so was that the only one that went to trial? That's the one that was seen as the test case of all test cases that we got here. Now, Lee Castleton's case, that was um, in late 2006, in court in late 2006, judgment in early 2007. Uh, that was when you were in the position of senior debt recovery manager. Um, would you have known about the case at the time? I, I wasn't until 2007. I, did, I went into the role in late 2007. Yes, sorry. So, so the same year as the Lee Castleton judgment. Yeah, I, I think I, when I took the, the role over, there was a cupboard within the office that had a very large box in it. And I was told that was the Lee Castleton case. Don't destroy it. It was seen as a test case. And, and were you so aware of why it was seen case. as a test case? No, other than proving that Horizon, to prove that Horizon worked was my, my understanding. And what was your understanding of why there was a need to prove that Horizon worked? Well, I don't, I don't think that it, it was the challenges that were, that were probably coming forward at that time. But I had no real, uh, it had no real impact on the areas that I was working on then. It wasn't until 2007 that I went into debt recovery. So from 2007 and going into debt recovery, uh, you very soon into that role were aware that there were challenges coming forward relating to the Horizon system. This one I was, but I wasn't aware of mass numbers. But you were aware of a, a particularly important case in the case of Lee Castleton that challenged the integrity of Horizon. Yeah, I, other than, yeah, and because it was a, a big box taking a lot of cupboard space up, I was told, don't ever destroy it. Thanks, that's come down. Um, 
In 2009, so two years later, there was an article in Computer Weekly about the Horizon system. Was that something that you were aware of or that was brought to your attention at the time? Uh, I believe Rod Ismay may have brought it to our attention that there was um, an article. An article that challenged the integrity of Horizon or that raised concerns about the integrity of Horizon? Yes. Uh, m moving on to the SEMA Misra case, can we look at poll 00093686? We're now at the 21st of October of 2010, so the next year. And if we could look at page five, please. Uh, could we zoom in to that bottom email, please? There's an email to um, yourself, I mean, it's to Mandy Talbot as well, and a number of other people. You're listed there alongside Rod Ismay, uh, Susan Crichton, etc. And it's about the Seema Misra case from Jarnail Singh, and he says, after a lengthy trial at Guildford Crown Court, the above named was found guilty of theft. Uh, this case turned from a relatively straightforward general deficiency case to an unprecedented attack on the Horizon system. Uh, we were beset with unparalleled degree of disclosure requests from, by the defence. Uh, through hard work of everyone, Council Warwick Tatford, Investigation Officer John Longman, and through the considerable expertise of Gareth Jenkins of Fujitsu, we were able to destroy to the criminal standard of proof, beyond all reasonable doubt, every single suggestion made by the defence. Uh, it is to be hoped that the case will set a marker to dissuade other defendants from jumping on the horizon bashing bandwagon. Um, why were you a recipient of this particular email? Because I believe that we'd got debt outstanding for Seema Misra. Do you recall receiving it? I don't know whether I can or not. Um, I can remember the Seema Misra trial, which um, it, it, I know it was a, a, a instigated by security, I believe, as a, a criminal prosecution. If we look at the comments from Jarnell Singh there, it's to be hoped uh, uh, the case will set a marker to dissuade other defendants from jumping on the horizon-bashing bandwagon. Would that comment have struck you as unusual, business as usual, totally normal, something else? I think it's probably very unprofessional for it to be written like that. Because, of course, you were already aware of the Lee Castleton being a significant case in respect of the protecting the integrity of Horizon. Uh, we now have the Seema Misra case. Uh, were you, as at this time, so October 2010, do you think it's fair to say that you were aware of, of reputational concerns at the post office about the Horizon system? Um, yes, that they were being raised, but equally that the business was defending that uh, Horizon was robust. So I think that's what the message that was coming down, um, down the line, that Horizon, the integrity of Horizon, um, it, it was a robust system. Um, but you were also being made aware that there were quite significant challenges to the Horizon system. It, well, there's two there, yes. Um, can we look at poll 00073014? I'll move away from Seema Misra for a minute, but I will return to that case yeah. in a second. Um, thank you very much. We have there, um, if we look at the subject, it's uh, Catherine uh, McElerney. It's a case that um, we may he be hearing more about in due course. We have their 22nd of September 2011, so the next year. And this is, who, who was Jacqueline uh, Whittam? I believe she was the team leader for former agents at that time. Thank you. Could we please, um, I'm going to actually, if we, I'm going to start. Yeah, I'll read quite a bit of that email out, actually. 
It says, Dear Joe, we currently have some cases on hold where former agents are claiming that Horizon has caused their discrepancies, and so this case gives us some cause for concerns. The ideal solution for us would be to secure a confidential settlement of £4,000 to £6,000 on commercial grounds, uh, which would avoid any risk of criticism of Horizon by the judge. Uh, to progress to court, I think uh, we would need to give serious consideration to acquiring the Fujitsu data to validate the integrity of our Horizon system. So I'm going to take each of those one by one. We're currently having some cases on hold. So you were aware that there were cases on hold where Horizon was being raised as the uh, source of discrepancies, and that's September 2011. I think that was the JFSA cases. Uh, the ideal solution is a settlement so that we avoid any criticism of Horizon. Was that an approach that you were familiar with from within the post office? Um, yeah, I think it was suggested by one of the solicitors as well. But I think around that, I've read the other papers on this, there was um, a, a, a cheque for 4,100 and something pounds. So that's why the um, suggested 4,000 was there, that there was a cheque within the deficit of 10,000 that had not been received at the processing centre, so we'd not had the funds. So I think that's probably where the rationale came from for four to six, six thousand. If the post office was concerned about criticism of Horizon by the judge, why yeah. would they pursue the matter at all if there was cause to criticise Horizon? Potentially, we shouldn't have then. You know, in in that that scenario. And then the final sentence there about uh, giving serious consideration to acquiring Fujitsu data to validate the integrity. Um, do you recall there being issues with obtaining data from Fujitsu or cost implications or a reluctance to obtain that data? Yeah, so I think on this debt of £10,000, Fujitsu were um, quoting 6000 something to gain the data, which again commercially is, commercially is madness. Might it be worthwhile to acquire the data before bringing an action against a sub-postmaster? Then, as, yeah, yeah, I suppose that that could have been one way around, but the cost of doing that, I, there were no budgets held for requesting data from Fujitsu by the um, FSC teams. And the quotes that were, were being said were astronomical. Do you think, in all those circumstances, it was appropriate uh, to pursue settlement in the post office's favour when you knew, for example, that uh, there could be arguments about Horizon, uh, that the post office might have difficulty in um, proving parts of I, its case? I, I think possibly on this case, and I can't be 100% certain without seeing case papers, that... Um, this postmistress hadn't raised Horizon issues until uh, Joe Napier went uh, or sent his um, his paperwork or, or his letters over. The solicitor in Northern Ireland sent the paperwork to her. So I don't know whether she'd responded and said it was a Horizon case prior to us sending it to legal. Uh, and was the burden always on the sub-postmaster themselves to try and figure out what it was that was going wrong with their system? Potentially, yes. But I think if you get a letter saying you owe £10,000 worth of debt broken down in this way, and initially you, you've not responded to us to say, I believe it's a system error, error or a rise and cause this, then the normal BAU process would take place. I mean, you were at the top of the tree in terms of management of this team, and you weren't even very familiar with system errors, were you? Do you think it was no. appropriate to put that burden on a sub mistress? Um, potentially not, no. Um, but it, equally, it's what level of reporting it or, or telling us there was an issue had taken place, and I don't know that. You know, you'd have to look at the paper case on this 
to understand what level of communication we had. I'm going to return to the Seema Misra case. Can we look at poll 0005768681? Sorry, Mr. Blake, before you do, um, just the first sentence, um, Ms. Bolsover, are you the Alison referred to there? Yes, I am. So before this email was written, you'd actually reviewed what was to happen with Jacqueline Whittam. Is that, is that correct? Uh, that's what the email says. When Joe Napier wrote back to say it was being challenged, the, the debt was being challenged. Um, I believe Jack, uh, Jackie sat down with me and reviewed what was in the case at the time. And, and this email, no doubt, was written as a, re as a result of the work that you and she did on, on the available information? Yes. Fine, thank you. Returning to the Seema Misra case, can we look at poll 00057681? We're going broadly chronologically. And if we look at the second page there, there's an email from yourself to Jenny Smith and Zoe Topham. Can you assist us with who they were? Um, Zoe was the post postal officer on former agent's debt, and I think Jenny was the team leader. Thank you. And that, that's an article that you're forwarding, and it's, you say they're Misra, so it, it's about the Seema Misra case. Yeah. And if we scroll up, we can see an email from yourself to Dave Posnett and others, including Rod May as well. And I'm just going to read that email. You say, Dave, the Misra case was closed on the 1st of March 2011, uh, but she's been in court in April 2012, reconfiscation hearing. See new article on link below. Uh, can we have an update on this and a view on if any further work, re-civil recovery, would be viable, as it looks like there are no assets left here to go after? Uh, this is one of the cases on our Horizon Issues spreadsheet uh, that we may need to close. Can you assist us with what the Horizon Issues spreadsheet was, please? Um... Uh, this, I, I don't know whether it was justice for sub postmasters or, or not. I, I, I'm, I'm struggling on the timeline of, you know, w what was raised by what what areas, whether it's an MP's case or a, a justice for sub postmasters case. So at some point in, in 2012, there was either a yeah. complaint raised by members of parliament or complaints raised by the Justice for Sub Postmasters Alliance uh, that caused yeah. the post office to build up a Horizon Issues spreadsheet. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. And can you assist us with what was on the Horizon Issues spreadsheet or what you considered to be a Horizon issue? Not only that it had been raised as a Horizon issue, so it, it was just a, a brand, the branch name, the fad, the FAD code, um, the date, and that it had been raised raised as an horizon hit issue, not the details of the issue. And as at 2012, did it have quite a lot of names, only a few? I don't know. Um, who was responsible for managing the Horizon Issues spreadsheet? Um, I think it was the team in Chesterfield that put it on the horizon sheet, if or the solicitors advised us that these were the Horizon Issues cases. I think it may have been the latter, that we'd been informed that these were um, postmasters that were claiming Horizon. So we kept a list of all cases. Thank you. If we can scroll up, we'll see the emails that followed. Um, from Zoe Topham, former agent debt team. I refer to the latest developments below. Please could you confirm if you attended the confiscation hearing? Also, I know that Ms. Misra's house had been repossessed and back in January was being sold. Do we know how much this went for and where the money went? Obviously, if the house was repossessed, then Ms. Misra would not have received any payment from the sale. And the response above that is my understanding from Jarnail Singh, who deals with criminal cases for the post office, is that confiscation order remains in place, albeit for a nominal sum of one pound. 
on the basis that Misra has no assets. Uh, this can, however, be varied in the event that her financial position changes in the future. Uh, are you able to assist us with how the relationship was between yourselves and the um, criminal team and how it was that you became involved in emails about a criminal case? Uh, because there was a debt outstanding. So there would have been a debt um, on the customer line for West Byfleet. Um, and we wanted to know what was the next part of the process. Were, were the security team recovering the debt or not? And if they saw no advantages in... So if, if they'd not gone through with the case, do they see an advantage in us going for civil recovery or trying to make civil recovery? And you say in your statement that the decision to take proceedings to recover debt via the criminal courts was a decision of the security and investigations team. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Um, so we, we was, wouldn't pursue civil recovery if there was a criminal investigation or an investigation taking place. The, the, the debt would be blocked and noted that it was with security. And the decision-making, though, you've said it was the security and investigations team. Am I right to say that the ultimate decision, then, in your view, was not with a, a legal team of some sort? I, I don't know the processes around uh, the security team's uh, decision-making. Now, we, we've spoken about the receipts and payments mismatch issue. Do these emails about the Seema Misra case, do they assist you in giving a timeline as to when you were aware of the receipts and payments mismatch issue? No, I, I didn't know that. That's, if Seema Misra was part of that, I don't, I don't know about that. But do you think it was around 2012 that you found out about that issue, very roughly? I didn't work on it, so I don't, I don't know. I'm only doing it from memory. This is what I remember at the time, but when I did my statement, but I can't remember actual dates around it. I, I can remember all the letters being on a SharePoint site in Chesterfield, and I think they were still there when I left for the receipts and payments mismatch, which would probably you know, guide you around what time this happened. Thank you. But, can can no. we please look at poll 00073165, please? I'm going back in time slightly, just back to the end of uh, 2011, December 2011. We have an email from yourself um, in the... Sorry, the bottom half of the page. To Emily Springford and Sabrina, can you assist with who Emily and Sabrina were? They were legal, within the legal internal legal team, I think. And you say, Emily, Sabrina, read my action from the meeting last week. Please see the attached file for all cases that I have and the recommendations made to progress. Uh, can you confirm your availability for a telephone conference, etc. Um, then you have an update on the JFSA meeting, and you say, of the 533 live cases, there are 23 known cases that are horizon challenges, uh, totaling £751,000. Are you able to assist us? We, we saw reference earlier to a horizon spreadsheet. Is that the same issue or a different issue to, to this particular correspondence? I, I think it's probably the same the same as, as what was quoted then, yes. So in December 2011, it's likely that there were 23 cases that were considered to be horizon challenges of some sort. Yeah. And then there's suggestions about which ones are progressed. If we scroll down, I, don't, I won't take you to the individual cases, um, but there's reference to... Uh, which ones will be proceeded with or how they'll be proceeded with. Well, was there a pause at any stage in respect of recovering from Horizon-related cases? Was there a what, sorry? A, a pause on the recovery action. The, the fact that something's on a spreadsheet, that, does that mean that you paused action until there was further investigation on these particular cases? These were all paused, yeah. 
And I think the the request was made, how would we prioritise these cases if we were to resume um, if we were to resume debt recovery? And can we look at poll 00085749? There's a document produced by Emily Springfield, Royal Mail Legal Services. Do you remember Emily Springfield? Yes, I, I remember. I remember Emily's name. Is this a document that you recall seeing? In the bundle, I, I can't remember prior to this, but um, from the bundle, I, I remember reading it. And it seems that in December 2011, there was a weighing up as to whether to uh, pursue those who had raised Horizon issues um, for debt or, or, or not. Is that right? Is that something you recall? Yes. And she's there weighing the benefits and risks. Can we look at the risks, please? I think this was done on the request of Susan Crichton. Thank you. And the risks there, if the post office is pursuing claims in several county courts, there's a risk that the post office could lose some as the quality of judges is variable. Is that, is that something that you heard said at all? Not particularly, no. Um, yeah. Post office could uh, be accused of acting prematurely uh, and potentially penalised on costs if it were to start court proceedings against that Scott Darlington and Mr Walters while the pre-action dialogue with Shoesmiths was ongoing. And you then say, I mean, sorry, she then says, arguably bringing more claims will increase the risk of systemic problems coming to light, such as training or support failures. However, there is little that can be done to minimise the risk apart from analysing the claims carefully at the outset and bringing them in batches uh, with the strongest first as suggested. Now, in 20, December 2011, were you aware of, of um, concerns that systemic problems uh, might come to light, systemic problems that relate to Horizon, appreciating that in brackets there we have training and support failures as, as what are recognised as systemic problems? I don't know what Emily... Springford's where she where she put that from, got that from, so you know I can't I can't really comment on what she's written there. Were you so aware? I think you just asked about spreadsheets. So the JFSA, there are also letters coming in from Shoe or Shoesmith or Shoesmith type letters coming in to the legal team or to ourselves. Yes, uh, and were you aware? of concerns at the post office about the risk of systemic problems coming to light? I think, yes, and I think that's that's why the messages kept, kept, kept coming down that say Horizon was robust. Um, so, thank you, that can come down. So, so, by the end of 2011 and into 2012, you knew about the Lee Castleton case that was important in defending Horizon. You knew about the Seema Misra case that needed to defend the Horizon system. Uh, you knew that the post office wanted to avoid criticism of Horizon, uh, and it's there being circulated uh, that there were systemic problems about the Horizon system. You also have the spreadsheet of concerns being raised about the Horizon system. Um, yep. Did you not at that point think that it was important for your team to be aware uh, of those concerns and criticisms of the Horizon I, system? I think they were from the communication that came came down line. But it was always rebuffed that Horizon was reliable. Was your impression that the company, uh, the post office, was doing enough in, in that regard? Communicating to, to teams or... Um, communicating that there were significant issues being raised with the Horizon product? I don't think... When you say it's considerable, I, I don't know what the numbers were. I, I knew what cases we'd got flagged as potentially raising it as an Horizon issue. 23 known cases in... in as at 
um, December 2011. 23 that alleged horizon, yeah. Plus concerns about systemic problems. Plus two very significant but cases that uh, were uh, um, trying to defend the horizon system. But yeah, I think at that time there was about 14,000 officers, so the ratio was potentially small. Not, not that that, you know, it negates anything else, but two cases out of potentially 550 that I had, or even 23, were a low percentage. I think that, that was two lead cases which were used by the post office. Um, I think by this period you also knew about, or likely to have known about, the receipts and payments mismatch issue. Potentially, yeah. Do you think at this time the post office was doing enough to interrogate the integrity of the horizon system? Potentially not, no. Did you consider that continued enforcement action against our postmasters in 2011, 2012, during the period of those emails that we've seen, uh, do you think that that was appropriate in all the circumstances? In, I, I think in respect of, was it raised back to us as an issue? So if you're sent a letter and you vehemently don't agree with it, you would get in touch with the issuer. So, you know, if somebody wrote to me to say, I owe this much money, I'd want to know why I do. And here's your statement. So work out, did I owe that money? So I think some of it, whilst I appreciate issues have been raised and numbers have risen, if, if, you, if you, as the recipient of that debt letter, don't come back to the post office and say, hold on a minute, you know, it's not this, it's caused by this, then we would continue on the process that was set in place. Do you think it was fair, given the imbalance in the state of knowledge between the two parties, for the burden to be on the sub-postmaster, to be the one who has to bring that forward? I, I think if you, you consider... There wasn't just Horizon um, that came into play for branch discrepancies. When you consider we may be issuing a, thousand, a million pound a month in credit TCs to a branch, that should have been offset against a branch discrepancy that they've got. So if there was a, you know, a branch discrepancy, there must have been hundreds of branch discrepancies that postmasters may have made good. And we were crediting them back with the transaction corrections that we, we sent out. So it's a, it's a wider picture. But a million pound a month in credits going back out to branches is a lot of misbalances within branch. It's not necessarily caused by Horizon. As I've said, you know, the cash scenario is a postmaster counting the cash to send to the cash centre and that cash being counted under camera and a shortage or a surplus being found. But a million pound a month is a lot that could, could potentially be classified as an Horizon issue that wasn't. But before we break for lunch, I'll take you to one example that might uh, assist you with a potential consequence of that attitude. Uh, can we look at poll 00090669, please? Page 11. We're now in May 2012, so after many of those documents that I've just taken you to about concerns with the horizon system. Page 11, please. There's an article in North West Wales News, uh, BBC News, sub-postmistress Marjorie Williams sentenced uh, for post office fraud. Uh, sub-postmistress who stole more than £14,000 to help the community shop open uh, has escaped a prison sentence. And we look, please, at the page before. Um, just for your information, that particular case, uh, the 
conviction was subsequently quashed. Um, the Court of Appeal found that it was an unexplained shortfall case, that there was a basic failure to investigate the issues that she had raised in interview, uh, nothing su to suggest that ARQ data had been obtained and that there was no evidence to corroborate uh, Horizon evidence that was used against her. Can we please look at page 14, sorry. Fourteen, we have an email from Helen Dickinson, April 2012. Uh, please see attach the case closure. Um, a full recovery of 14,000 has been achieved, uh, and there's a big yay there on the top. And if we go back to page 10, which is the reference to the BBC News article in May 2012, um, Matthew Hibbard, who is a product uh, accountant says, she sounds like a nice lady just doing her best, then the nasty post office comes along and finds an error. I bet this is your fault, and he sent that to you. Why did people at the post office, including within your team, uh, feel that they were able to joke about Horizon cases as late as uh, May 2012, um, given it, all, all of those documents that we've looked at with uh, spreadsheets being put together about uh, problems uh, being raised about the Horizon system. I, I think you'd have to direct that question at Matt Hibbard on why he sent it through. Uh, was he somebody who you were managing? No, he was a senior manager within product and branch accounting. Do you think that there was an atmosphere within the post office uh, that saw the conviction uh, of um, Miss Williams uh, uh, something to joke about? I don't know. He, he obviously did. Uh, thank you, sir. I can't send that, can I? You know, I, and I can't. It's in writing. Wow. So might that be an appropriate moment to take our lunch break? It is, but I just want to address Mr Enright or... If, if Mr. Steen or um, Mr. Jacobs are present, then. So could the camera yes. go on to those persons, Mr. please? Mr. Steen and Mr. Enright are both present. Right. Fine. Well, I understand that um, Mrs. McElerney and Mr. Scott Darlington and members of their family are present. And one of the reasons they came uh, to the inquiry this morning was their belief that Ms. Bolsover was giving evidence in person. So that's right. And I, I'm very sorry that um, that uh, understanding on their part wasn't correct and that the inquiry hadn't done more to alert the public at large, but those persons in particular, that this was a remote witness. Um, in the future, I will try to ensure that if a witness is giving evidence remotely, that that will be publicised in sufficient time for those who may be particularly interested in that witness to make a decision about, which, about whether they wish to attend the inquiry in person or, or look on through um, internet channels, if I can call it that, all right? But I just wanted to make that clear. Sir, thank you. Thank you for considering the matter. Yeah. All right, then we'll start again at 2 o'clock. Thank you.